Okay. Perfect. So, um, this is round one of the late spring Swiss, which I played about three weeks ago. Um, March 24th, two or three weeks ago. And I only played two, uh, two rounds of this particular tournament. So I'm already done with this tournament. Um, we're going to cover the first two rounds. And um, this was my first game. So the first game I drew um, Clark McCutcheon again. So two times in a row, I've had to play him in round one or round two. And um, I got white against him this time. So I got to play a uh, in English against him, and he played the King's Indian setup, which I'm familiar with. And it's actually my favorite setup to play against. And as you can see, this is very similar to how the normal plans are in the English. Oh. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and share. It does help me out, and it shows that you want to see more of this content. Um, I hope that you find this um, entertaining, and not only entertaining, but more importantly, I hope that you find it um, instructive to help you gain more um, rating points in your chess journey. So thanks for watching, everybody. All right, let's get further into it. So um, I'm going out with my normal plan, which is to get this battery going and trade this guy off. So we're gonna work towards that. Um, and this time I was a little bit more patient. Instead of um, going after it right away, um, I was a little bit fearful of the B B5 um, and opening up this bishop. I didn't wanna allow that. So I was like, well, if he plays it now, I can always just trade back and um, I'm okay. So one of the typical ideas, like I'd mentioned in my game against Lawrence, if you watched that video, if you haven't, please go check it out, um, which was round four of the Spring Swiss, the, which would have been the last video I posted. Um, should be in the playlist. Um, the idea is to play f5, okay? And um, that is the typical idea getting a knight on c5 and pushing f5 and trying to disrupt my king side. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna be a little bit more patient and I'm gonna allow him to play f5. I'm gonna bring my, knight, my, my rook over with the anticipation that he's going to play f5 and there's gonna be some exchanges in the center uh, later and my rooks are gonna become very active. That's the idea here, okay? That's my plan anyways. Um, without fail, he plays f5. Now, one of the things that you don't want to allow is for them to play f4 in the English. Now, he could play f4 here and it won't matter because we have all of this firepower on it. We're, we've got that square covered. He cannot play f5 or f4 anytime soon. If he does, we're, we're just going to win whatever's there. So it's not that big of a deal. Now, one of the things that I know about is that anytime that you play the English and they do play f5, it is generally, not always, but generally a really good idea to actually exchange on f5 um, for a number of reasons. Um, the most likely and the thing that most people want to do is that you want to trade here to open up this bishop. Now it does hit a big wall, but it is open. And now we have a resource to bring it in. And if they trade with the knight or with the bishop, that's okay. We're just gonna play f5 or f4 and kind of continue on. Um, but before we do that, we were actually going to just play e or d4 and we have this, this, and this on that square, and they only have um, this, this, and this. So we're, we're fine, everything is fine here. Now he played a, a different move than I've seen. Um, this is a book move, and um, probably the best of the book moves. This is typically a move that I like to make from my side in my plans, but he's very familiar with these plans. 
and a very strong player that knows how to control the center because this is now controlling all of these squares. Really, really good to have that kind of control. So I said, anytime you see f5, um, you exchange an f5, and if there is a pawn there, you stop that pawn from advancing anymore, and now you go from there. So now he moved his knight back. Idea being is if he doesn't do that, I'm going to play here, and we're going to have a bunch of exchanges, and um, things are going to open up. And I don't think he wants that. So, and it gets a little bit forcing if there's a knight there, because now he has to do something about it. So now, um, if I play it, he is free to kind of continue on. And he doesn't, he's not forced to have to do anything because that knight's not under attack. Okay, I play d4 anyways, which this is probably a controversial move. Reason being is they can play e4, and Clark did play e4, which really kind of hinders my bishop. So, Rick Handler, hey, how's it going? Welcome. So a lot of people might look at this particular move and think, well, that's really not a good idea. Um, and maybe it's not. But I figured for the sake of activity that it would be because this is going to be a tough thing to deal with. He's only got two pieces on it, and I can blow it open when I want to. I can move this over and move my rooks over. And I'm going to open lines towards his king before he will open lines to my king. And I get to kind of dictate a lot of that. Even if he decides to trade here, I can always come in with the knight, the bishop, or the pawn, and um, things are fine. Could it blow up in my face? Yeah, it could. Um, but I, my peace activity, it, to me is a lot has a lot more activity than his does um, now playing d4 here he gets the ability to lock things down and some might think that this is a positional um, mistake and it might be um, I'm not sure um, I know that allowing it for a pass pawn is not traditionally a good idea, but maybe you could have tried f takes e4. Um, yeah, I, I could have. I, I thought about that. Um, that is an idea that I was thinking about, but I was not. I was not sure because there's too many things. One, there, there's a few reasons why I decided not to. One, if I if I take here, we're gonna add a new variation. There's three things that I have to do. I have to consider any of those, and then uh, there's also this move that I I didn't really want to ever allow happen. Now. I have that square completely covered. It really is probably not an issue, but it's not something I even want to have to deal with or calculate at all. Um, and I felt like if he gets this here, I don't know that I like this move. I don't know that I like this move. And I don't know that I like this move either. Um, F4 would hurt him more. But, which he wouldn't do right away, um, but I think that any one of these other moves, then also bringing this knight in, just, I, I didn't like any of it. And to be honest with you, um, I'm not sure um, I wanted him to have that much counterplay. And maybe it's okay. Um, but I looked at this for probably two minutes and I decided to myself that I didn't like any of the lines 
and it looked completely unclear to me. And I'm not necessarily trying to open lines. Um, in some cases, I don't mind closing lines either because um, I'm very comfortable in closed positions. What I was doing with this move was hoping that it would force him to do something about one of these or push on. And I was comfortable with any of those moves. Um, I was most comfortable with him taking here, which I didn't think that he would do. And I was okay with him taking here because then I can bring my knight in or my pawn or this guy or this guy. I had lots of options and I felt any one of those pieces there would be very good, especially my knight because then I can go after a bishop and I could win the bishop pair and I felt like that was good. And even if he pushes on, which I expected him to do, I felt like I, even here I felt as though I had better chances um, and I felt like my king was more protected. I could be completely wrong in my assessment here, but my idea was to then push d5 and get some things going and get my knight into d4 or my bishop into d4, trade off that dark square bishop and my king is a lot safer than his king. Now there's a lot of pieces on the board, but as things get traded off, I felt like this was maybe a better position for me. I could be completely wrong here. I don't know what the evaluation is here. If I'm just looking at it, um, I don't know. Uh, I have some holes, but he has no way of getting in to any of those holes at this time. So maybe it's close to even. I feel like it might be a slight advantage to white. Um, I guess there are some potential threats with him being able to move his king over and rook over and queen out. There's some of these options that are possible. But all of it's really slow and I think at this point now I have a lot of time. Um, at least that's where my head was at. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I also have ideas here of getting my king onto the h file, either here or here, doesn't really matter, and then pushing on and getting my rooks and queen over. It's going to be slow because now that it's kind of locked down, I have the time to do it. And that's kind of where my head was at. Um, I felt like I had the uh, uh, better maneuvering chances than my opponent. So um, I decided to push on and kind of force some things or try to force things. Um, this pawn right here is weak. And if I can start getting some pieces in here, he's only got one piece on it right now. I thought, you know, um, I wouldn't say that it's win very winning for white here. Um, but this could turn ugly for, for white very quickly if I'm not careful. But the thing is, is I feel more comfortable, I, I feel as though I'm more comfortable in this position than my opponent is because I play the English all the time and my opponent, though he plays the King's Indian defense all the time, does not have a King's Indian defense that he's familiar with. Um, and I feel like I've got better attacking chances than he does. Is it winning for me? Mm, that's tough to say. But I feel as though I have all the chances in making the, the peace exchanges over him where I can start making things happen. There is a lot of potential on the a1 and h8 file um, after I play d5, which is exactly where this game kind of heads. He trades and trades. And I thought about taking with the pawn here, but... I didn't want a pawn on that square because I want to some in a in a perfect future I want to get my queen there. So 
we trade and now I've realized maybe one of the errors of my ways which was to allow a piece to get into d3 um, which is okay and I get my trade that I'd like and I move my king out to protect my pawn so I have the ability to move this knight um, there's probably some other key sequences here to consider. Um, the thing is, is even if it, any of these trades that he comes to me with, I feel are beneficial to me. And if he allows me to trade, I think, I think both are beneficial to me, both ways. If I get to trade it on the squares they're on, they're great, uh, they're good. But if, they, if he comes to trade with me, I believe they're better for me. So I feel like I'm good either way. So we do a little bit of maneuvering and I was like, okay, well, I knew that this was gonna have to be a thing. I was gonna have to allow this concession. But though that knight's here and it is attacking my rook, it's not doing a lot. Um, yeah, it's in my position and it might have the potential to wreak havoc, but you know, I've got enough space to where my pieces still can move freely. And none of these are ideal squares for any of my pieces anyways. So it's almost like that knight has the potential to just be stuck. And you know, there's probably some tactics here potentially with uh, a bishop sacrifice and this knight now being a little squirrely. Um, I wonder if that's actually worth it. Does this work? Takes, takes, takes. So we're down, we've got two pawns for a piece with a threat. Knight can still go back to c5, but that attacks my rook. So that doesn't particularly work, at least not there yet. So what about this way? He takes, and now what about? Still doesn't work. Comes back. Threaten the queen. I don't think that works either. Does not. I feel, I feel, like my intuition is telling me there's something there. And maybe it's not that move, but I feel like something's there. All right. So I played a little bit more of a solid move. I was trying to make some things work during this particular uh, game. And I, I saw some tactics and I couldn't make anything work. So I played a, a solid move I like this one. And um, I was just gonna load up after this weak pawn and um, get some exchanges and trades. I was not, um, I was a little surprised that he tried to do this. It makes, like, during the game anyways. I was like, why is he trying to do this? But I get it now. I didn't see it during the game, but he's trying to open lines. And um, it makes a lot of sense to do this. And now this bishop looks a little funky, but I, I'm, I'm getting my plan in because I'm, my whole idea was to get my bishop to f1 to trade this piece off. And now we're gonna just have mass liquidation. Um, and now there's some threats here I have to deal with. And we had some more trades. Um, I couldn't allow some things to happen. So I thought, okay. And I, can't, I found this resource. Um, no, yeah. It kind of yeah, I, it's a queen. It ends up to be a queen ending, 
Um, and maybe there's a better way. I, I think there's a better way somewhere. Um, I don't remember where it was. I looked at it with my plus at my club and we found something. If he doesn't trade rooks. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think he was expecting me to trade. Yeah, trade one rook, not both. And just trade this way. Yeah, this might be better. I'm not sure though. Thanks for the follow. Von Doom, welcome. Um, What's the sequence? Rook takes D3. All right, so. Rook takes d3. Welcome, welcome. Queen to e2. Oh. That's a. Why would I move queen to e2? That's a losing move. 31. Oh, queen to e2. And then rook to c3. Oh, here. Um, yeah, maybe. Potentially. I'm not so sure though. Um, yeah, I mean this pass pawn might be might be a killer, but. I have this resource, so I feel like um, his king's so wide open. I, I feel like I have I I feel like I have all the counterplay, and he's not going to do a lot with that. That probably would have been a better try for him, though. You're probably right. I'm curious to know what the evaluation is in this position. Um, Or even something like that. I don't know if that's anything either. Yeah, it's it's dangerous, but I think it's very counter counter punching for both sides. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe rook f3 is better. Not allowing my queen to get in, but no, I don't. I don't think so. Can I? Forcing a queen trade is probably not a good idea. Queen c3 is a pretty big threat. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that's not how the game played out, but these are interesting lines. Um, these are lines I didn't see. Like, what's the move after this? And how, how do you progress? Because any move he makes now, I have checks and, and potential. Uh, I, I have a bunch of potential um, perpetual checks. Yeah, so I've got checks here, here. Uh, I'm going to pick up this pawn somehow. <laughs> I'm not sure. 
I don't think he can really leave the defense of the king. You know, um, he's got to keep this queen back here. If he tries to come in, I'm going to get perpetual checks either way, I think. So I think maybe that's not as good as this one because now I can't get in. But can I provide perpetual checks any other way? Queen e8, you're talking about queen e8. Queen h5, queen g7, coming after this pawn. Okay. Queen e8, queen f8. Queen e8, queen f8. Uh, this is dangerous. I don't think you can do that. This is coming then. You're talking about here? I don't think it... Maybe it doesn't matter. I think it's the same, or similar anyways. I mean, how do you stop this? Yeah, rook, rook d8's coming, no matter what he does. And if he doesn't do anything to take care of this pawn, yeah, I, I think I think you're right. I, th I think we found rook, rook f3. You can't let me in. But, so let's let's take a look at this. What are my options now? I, th I think we just have this. Is now we have this and this and this even if he comes in here that's not good we can't do that can't allow that so we have to be careful of that Queen c2 is goes after that guy so how do we deal with that? I mean, we just do rook d8 or uh, queen d8 or d2. I mean, yeah, it gets tough for sure. I I think you're right though. It makes it more complicated allowing. Uh, not allowing for the rook trade. I don't know that it's winning for black. Maybe it is, but it's still tough to figure out as we could, as we found. Um, he takes d3. Yeah. But yeah, here here he offered me a draw and I took it because I was afraid. Now I I feel like maybe. I feel like maybe I could, this is maybe a win. Rook f3 is the killer. Rook takes d3. Oh, rook. Let's go back. Oh, even here. Yeah, maybe maybe D takes. Maybe um, E takes D three. I don't know though. Yeah, the pawn's hanging. You can't do that. Yeah, it won't work.
Yeah, it's really interesting, some of these ideas. Bishop f1, okay. Rook to d7. Bishop takes d3. Rook takes d3. Rook takes d3, and then, then e takes d3. Yeah. Whoops, undo. Nope. Yeah, maybe this is a better way to play it. I'm not so convinced, though. Queen C2, okay. Queen C3. Yeah, your your rook is your rook's stuck there, and no matter what, it's coming with check too. So you're gonna have to get off this file no matter where you go. It's coming with check. I'm gonna pick up that pawn. That's losing. Yeah, this is a we're it's a, a tough position. There's another spot somewhere in this sequence around here where I had uh, I looked at it with my plus, and uh, we found that there was a sequence that gave me more of an advantage but it's tough to see I don't remember what it is because I, I feel like this was a mistake g4 no it wasn't a g4 uh, it was something with the bishop coming in or the knight how this all gets resolved but I don't remember what it was um, it was in a postmortem with uh, my plus so I, I don't remember it unfortunately because it's too long ago Yeah. But yeah, either way, a good game. Um, it resolved right here. He offered me a draw, and I thought for about two or three minutes, and I took it. And um, at this point, I thought it, there maybe there is a way. Yeah, it's something like that. There's something there where I win like two pieces for a rook or something like that. Um, I don't remember exactly where it's at, but so I thought for two or three minutes here and I really calculated a couple of lines after he offered me a draw and um, I was I was really kind of not sure how to deal with that. I thought for sure I could pick up this pawn there's a lot of perpetual checks, um, you know, even so, no matter what he does, if he doesn't keep putting me in check, I'm going to get my perpetual checks in. So I just took the draw here, a little bit fearful of not being able to stop this guy. Um, so I think he was expecting me to take and then winning the, the end game, but yeah. Yeah, maybe queen d7, and then we, we play on queen d7, new variation. And then I thought here, I, I, th I still think it's kind of, uh, kind of drawish. Um, but I mean, he's 400 points higher than me. Um, I'm 1,500 this point, and uh, he, he's 1,900, so... I'm not one to try to play for draws, but I felt like it was an appropriate way to go here. And since it's really, I felt though, I felt as though if I'd really tried to push this, I have the potential to lose. 
and I figured, you know what, getting a draw here for me is a big win. I played a really solid game. I felt good about the game. I calculated well. I didn't. I, I feel as though I didn't really make any mistakes. Maybe a few inaccuracies. Um, I don't believe there was any blunders. Um, I felt really good. So I was happy with taking the draw here. Um, mainly out of fear that I wasn't able to stop this pawn. Um, in worst case scenario, I have uh, this perpetual check going back and forth. Um, best case scenario, I could have won. So, but I didn't want to over push it and I felt like I was playing really well. I gotta take a look at my times on this game. So, yeah, I mean, at this point, we both had about a little over 20 minutes left at this point in the game. And, um, yeah, I played queen to h. He had 21 minutes and I had 23. So we definitely had time to play. But 20 minutes is not a lot of time to kind of calculate this whole end game. And this could get messy fast if I'm not careful. So um, I figured taking a draw here was probably a good good idea. I'm not exactly sure what the uh, evaluation is here. Maybe let me take a look. I think I have this someplace. I put this in a study. Let me see. Studies I contribute to. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to go take a look at this. You guys can see this. So I did analyze this with an engine later. So let's see. Um, actually, no, it didn't get tainted at all. So, I'm just curious about the end evaluation. Let's take a look. It's minus 1.2 here, probably because of that pass pawn. So, I mean, I felt like I took a good draw and he offered it. So, uh, I feel pretty good about that. I, yeah, I, I felt this was probably okay for me, but looking at the evaluation now, I'm pretty happy with my decision to take the draw. Um, even it, since he offered it, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't playing for a draw. I was playing to win. And I thought, um, I was going to have to deal with that pawn, but yeah, cool. Well, I feel pretty good about that. That's nice.